let me let me ask <laughs> then in a in the uh, in the situation where the surgeon may not have got it all. Yeah. Uh, almost never happens. We, <laughs> which, which almost <laughs> never happens. Uh, we do have to start thinking about systemic yeah, systemic well, that's a nice therapies. Segue to that. <laughs> uh, so when in, in, in your patients uh, when they come into the clinic, uh, do you automatically think about systemic therapy? Do you do you keep an eye on them and, and observe them at times? Uh, what's your approach there? So, I mean, I think, again, a key is individualizing and tailoring it to the patient. But I think, I think about um, a couple of key features, m many of which have been touched on, but um, one is grade. Um, so do they have a well-differentiated or poorly differentiated tumor? Um, and I think we're also all talking about metastatic cases at this point. Um, what is the extent of disease? Is it widespread or is it liver dominant disease? Um, what's the pace of their disease growth? So for a newly diagnosed patient, um, we don't yet know the pace, so sometimes that's important to determine that. Um, and then what is their primary site? We're primarily talking about pancreatic nets, but pancreatic versus other is also important. So if I'm meeting a, a newly diagnosed metastatic patient who's asymptomatic um, and has fairly low burden of disease and a well-differentiated tumor, I might watch that patient. Um, however, if I have someone who has bulky disease, um, symptoms from their disease, whether they be from tumor burden or from hormones, um, I might consider starting them earlier on treatment. I don't know if Diane has comments yeah. on that. Yeah. yeah, I think I do the same. I, certainly in a patient that's asymptomatic that was, you know, fell off the horse and got yeah, the scan that yeah. showed low volume <laughs> disease. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to let them get better from falling off the horse and not start any additional <laughs> treatments at that time. And I think, you know, people always say, but patients must have, I mean, how do you tell them that you're not going to do something? And I think that, that again, it's the, the importance of education there and saying, yeah. I'm not going to let you go away forever. It's a scan in three months to mm -hmm. make sure that the disease is absolutely remains stable. Um, and that first scan can be so critical in allowing uh, that patient a really important quality of life in terms of if it is stable, sometimes those patients can go for years or many, many months without, you know, the injection of a hormone uh, shot, yeah. which does have its own, you know, side effects in terms of cost, quality of life of, you know, getting to Manhattan in my case, which is terrible, <laughs> uh, and lots of other things in addition to gas, which I always blame on myself, you know, yeah. and, other, and other terrible uh, problems that can happen. So, I mean, I, I think that certainly with the low volume patients, um, watchful waiting is, is my uh, sort of first uh, treatment option. Having said that, I, I also at the same time educate patients on the ones that I'm worried about, as I sort of alluded to before, that this is not all, oh, you're going to die with the disease. This is a cancer, and we have to sort of respect it as such. And some patients can, you know, really succumb to the disease quite quickly. So um, those are the patients, and again, um, it's the KI-67, it's what the cancer looks like under the microscope is their burden of disease, and I agree at those patients, I'll definitely start treatment quicker. Yeah. So we've been alluding to some of the systemic treatments. There's been a, a huge amount of buzz about somatostan analogs in the, in the past few years. Uh, are those usually the drugs you think about as a first-line treatment for these people when you do decide to treat them? That's right. So smetastatin analogs are what I call my first string players. So they're the first ones that I generally start in patients that need treatment. Um, for a while, we had octreotide or sandostatin, and uh, the PROMID study did show us that it sort of put the brakes on the disease when partial responses were very rare. Um, in but that was... small bowel. Exactly. <laughs> Whether you took the words out of my mouth, but that was really <laughs> limited to mid-gut. Yeah. And we were using it for a while with no data to suggest that outside the mid-gut it was really working, although I think most of us would argue that our experience felt at least pretty confident that we were controlling um, the disease with um, octreotide as well. Um, but now we actually have great data that suggests that, in fact, lanreotide um, in the so-called gap nets, so in patients with pancreatic, foregut, midgut, and hindgut tumors, um, definitely had an improvement of progression-free survival when you started the therapy. So uh, those are treatments I would use as a first-line therapy. And the, the two drugs in terms of their biologic effects, similar, different, where do you see that? Yeah, so one's an intramuscular shot, the other is a very deep subcutaneous shot, so they're kind of off by about a millimeter in terms of how deep we're getting into the buttocks. Um, American sub-Q is increasing, though. That is true. <laughs> that is very true. Um, but having said that, you know, I think that um, the mechanism of action is almost identical when you look at the two co compounds. So I do believe um, that they are very similar in terms of that mechanism of action and their efficacy. Um, I think we should absolutely not do cross-trial comparisons to say that one is better than the other just because one PFS is better than the other, uh, given the difficulties and timing and patients that were enrolled on the two trials. 
Um, but I think they both prove, both the Perlman and the clarinet study show um, that somatostatin analogs, whether it's Lanry or Tidoractriotide, could be used for cytostatic control. And in terms of tolerability, what side effects do you tend to see with these, with these drugs? Yeah, you know, I, I think that most patients will complain of some cramping. Um, paradoxically, some of my patients get bad diarrhea. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the gas and sort of this cramping seems to be most common. You can see some elevated blood sugars, not frank diabetes per se, but that's something that I tell patients. Sometimes a little bit of elevated blood pressure, sometimes dizziness. But in general, uh, I call it my first drink player because the side effects are pretty well tolerated. Then in terms of side effects, there's some tricks. So those of us who have seen a lot of these patients yeah. know a few tricks. Uh, it is it is uh, puzzling sometimes. You start a drug and they actually get more diarrhea That's instead right. of less yeah. diarrhea. Uh, Rod, what do you use to treat such patients? What do you think is going on there? Well, certainly I can see this in patients. I see it, more, I think, more in patients with non-functional disease. I think when I'm treating a carcinoid patient or a vipoma patient, they already have such an extreme degree of diarrhea that whatever is happening in the background, it, it, they just get, they just sense overall improvement. But you know, it, it's a it's a profound, widespread inhibitor of hormones, and there are a lot of good hormones that keep your guts going slow that we're inhibiting as well, and it inhibits pancreatic uh, exocrine function mm -hmm. uh, and gallbladder emptying. So both of those functions can uh, can give people diarrhea, particularly when they're eating fatty foods, and so you can give them pancreatic enzyme supplementations. Um, and, and that sometimes helps the diarrhea, particularly if it's associated with a lot of foul smelling gas. And I ask the spouse about that if they're socially acceptable. <laughs> and, and that's usually my biggest clue. So the cure is pancreatic enzymes. It can, well, it's not so the cure, but it can help a yeah. great number of, of patients. Um, the carcinoid patients, sometimes they have bile salt diarrhea because we have taken out their terminal ileum that reabsorbs it. And so they, they may need something like a cholestyramine to help bind that. So that's another trick that we use. Um, and in terms of side effects, just going back to a surgical point, a very well-known side effect is that it causes uh, cholestasis and that can lead to gallstone formation. So when we're operating on neuroendocrine patients with liver metastases, we want to get their gallbladder swallowed there. So that's a point to, to realize, to you know, discuss if you're a surgeon or if you're discussing or referring a patient to a surgeon, have them get the gallbladder while they're in there. Whether you're doing liver metastectomy or not, if you're in the belly, you should take the gallbladder out. Correct. I think that's pretty much the guidelines now. Um, I think a part of the history is important to help sort out this diarrhea problem. And that is, you ask them, is your diarrhea worse the four or five days right before your shot or right after? If it's before, they may be subtherapeutic and their hormonal symptoms are taken over. If it's right after, it gives credence to the higher likelihood of this pancreatic insufficiency. And they just need to take enzymes for the first few days when they have the highest level right after their injection and it takes care of them. And I wanted to get back to your point about the not not doing nothing, but doing kind of watching, wait, watch for waiting. The way we get around that is we say, we're going to put you on active surveillance. That's right. <laughs> and they like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but that's, that's what great. you're doing. Yeah, you're watchful great. waiting, and you're waiting to drop the hammer to do something. Um, I would also want to throw it out there for patients that have what looks to be resectable disease, that you could do an R0 resection, but they have a high KI67 and a high mitotic index, and the biopsy says, somewhere between moderately and poorly differentiated. What do you think? What do you do next? So I think this gets to the issue of uh, post-operative therapy and somebody that you are worried no, about not, might have a just showed up. Take them they just showed up. They're not post-op, they're not pre-op, they're not, they just showed up and you have that information. Metastatic or not metastatic? Either way, but it looks like it could, you could achieve a complete R0 resection oh, okay. where they have one liver met or couple or maybe no liver mets but they have a unfavorable looking histology that's so the, kind of scary. The question of whether you would start with a systemic treatment or take them right to the operating room and how do we, right. how do we make that decision? That's the question, that's my question. So I think we're certainly a lot more worried about um, sending those patients to a surgeon. Rod, do you uh, operate on such patients? Well, I think, you know, most patients that I get don't have that type of KI-67, and if their disease looks operable, we will go right in. And following those patients along, they do well. The least gratifying experience I have is where I operate on someone and more disease follows right after, and it's, uh, it's either that I have to go back in and reoperate or, or they're just not a good surgical candidate anymore. 
And so it's, it's the circumstance that Phil's talking about where I would like to see some data about the cadence of the disease before I make a commitment. And so, yeah, I want them on a systemic therapy of some sort to prove that this disease can be controlled and that then maybe as a surgeon, I, I can play a role in decreasing the disease volume and the symptomatology for them. But if, if they're really out of bounds, then I, I have no interest in putting them through an operation and in that phase of their life.